2020, a virtual odyssey. We're very thrilled to be bringing you our seventh installation of this art show. This is an art show completely put on by the planetary science students here at the Lunar and Planetary Lab. My name is Allison McGraw and I'll be your host for this year's show. We have the largest amount of submissions that we've ever received, which is quite exciting. We are here today to open up the evening and we will have a series of presentations, speakers, and also some music at the end of the night. So we will start with the founder of the Planetary Science Show, Dr. Jamie Malaro, uh, who will be joining us afterwards for a live Q&A as well. So if you have any questions, please make sure that you hold on to them during uh, this time when we can then have Jamie follow up and answer anything that you might want to ask her. So I'm going to go ahead and play a video from Jamie. And again, we'll, we'll be meeting with Jamie directly after the show uh, to talk a little bit more with her. Institute in Tucson, Arizona, though I work physically from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. I'm also an artist and musician, and seven years ago when I was still a grad student at the Lunar and Planetary Lab, I wanted to host an art show, and from that was born the art of planetary science. So I thought I would offer a little bit of perspective on how the show developed over the years and what I think we've accomplished. While they may seem very different, Science and art are both very creative acts. So this exhibition uses art as a tool for exploring the beauty of science and our relationship with it as people and as a society. Many of you have participated in and attended our shows before, but if you haven't, you'll find two different types of art. Well, more of a spectrum, really. So on one side of the spectrum, we ask artists to create works that are inspired by astronomy, planetary science, geology, and other related you know, scientific fields. And we get a huge variety of mediums represented at these shows. We have paintings, drawing, digital works, photography, sculpture, glass, textiles, paper, film, poetry, even music and dance. I've always really been impressed with uh, the variety of, of, of styles, mediums, and, and perspectives that we get at each show all surrounding the same kinds of topics and the same subjects. And on the other side of the spectrum, we ask scientists to create works that contain scientific ideas or that are actually created out of scientific data or data from our research. These could be images from laboratory experiments or spacecrafts, diagrams from research papers, representations of scientific equations, or other ways of incorporating concepts into, into our artwork. Because and this is one of the things that makes our show, I think, so special is that this isn't just about viewing something pretty. It's really about exploring the connections between science and art, between the process of creating self-expression and the process of creating knowledge. And it's about how we use creativity to explore the universe in both ways, about the different perspectives that each person can offer or interpret through both the making and the viewing of the art. You know, for me as a scientist, it's about stepping outside of my job as an expert on the solar system to ask other people, to ask the public what it is that they feel inspired by. And it's about finding a way to show them why we think science is beautiful in a way that is interesting. Um, because, because science is beautiful. It's not just the landscapes that we see, but it's the processes that create those landscapes, the intangible forces that move the planet, you know, the mysteries of their fundamental makeup from atomic scales all the way up to the universe scale. And as scientists, we see that beauty every day in our research, but it's often hidden away from others and boring scientific papers written in a way that many people, sometimes including fellow scientists, have a difficult time understanding. 
So we really wanted to find a new way to communicate with others about our work. And as it turned out, the art community also really wanted to show us their work. So our first show was in 2013. And I went to the department head, Dr. Timothy Swindle, and I said, Tim, on a casual basis, I said, Tim, I want to show the beautiful side of science to the public. I want to put on an art show. I want to show people that science is beautiful, the universe is elegant, that um, our jobs are creative, and all this stuff. And he kind of looks at me, thinks for a moment, and says, OK, go do that. And he told me later that he didn't really think it would work. Um, and, you know, thankfully he was wrong and in large part due to his support, the show became very successful. For me, um, I think at that time, I just kind of naively assumed that it would work out somehow without really thinking about it too hard. Although, you know, the deeper I got into planning, the more I realized what a big undertaking it was to, to put on art show. I'd never done this before. And it was a big undertaking. It was really a monumental effort, way more work than I you know, even thought about when I had the idea and jumped into it. Um, you know, had a lot of help from other volunteer graduate students, help from um, staff in the department. I roped in my friend and fellow graduate student, Dr. James Keene, to help me organize since he was also an artist. And we have really had to figure out the nuts and bolts of exactly how to do it. You know, where do I even find artists? Will any of them be interested in making art about space? There was a huge amount of community outreach work um, involved in order to network, find local art organizations to promote to, and things like that. And then we had to figure out, how am I even going to hang this art. You know, we're not an art gallery, we're a science department. Um, you know, we had to find infrastructure to hang the art on. Uh, how am I going to attract people to come to the event once I hang all the art up? And how am I going to do all of this, you know, without any money? So once we had about 50 artists sign up, um, you know, submit actual works that they wanted to present at the show, I went to the department head and I asked for a little bit of money. And I think he was pleasantly surprised, honestly, as was I, that it seemed to be working. You know, he wasn't sure it was going to work, but he hadn't wanted to discourage me. Everyone knows sometimes when you try new things that great things can come out of it. So he said, okay, and he gave me some money for some basic, you know, supplies. We had other supplies donated for, uh, by a local scientist and LPL alum, Dr. Joe Spitali, to help us hang the art. We also got some donated news coverage by local radio and print outlets that really, I think, helped us a lot. When event night came, we had all in all about 75 artists who participated in that first show. We had about 120 pieces of art. Um, and the crowd was a bit over 300 people for you know, a one night event on a random Wednesday in December. We were thrilled. And you know, you know, as organizers, we met so many interesting artists and it turns out that, you know, we didn't know this, but Tucson was the perfect place for a show like this. You know, there's both a large science and space science community here and a large art community here. And we had created the space for both communities to meet and interact with each other that didn't exist in a normal art gallery. Uh, you know, it didn't exist at the other types of outreach events the department, you know, was doing. So we really felt like that first year was quite successful. Of course, we wanted to do it again the following year. Uh, this time, I had more help uh, from Hannah Tankery and Dr. Sarah Peacock. They joined the organizing team. And we made our best effort to improve on what we'd learned from the year before. And you would think it would be easier the second and third time you do this. But I assure you, the amount of work that organizers do every single year, including this year, is huge. And you're really pretty exhausted about it you know, by the end. Um, in the second year with uh, Dr. Swindle's support, the department did put up some more funds uh, to buy some additional infrastructure, things like poster boards and lights to make the event more sustainable. Um, we got some additional support from uh, the Space Imaging Center. And of course, you know, we had a lot of help from the department staff in terms of like ordering supplies, shipping things, especially from Maria Schuker and getting things printed. Um, we really appreciated all the support we were getting. This show would not have been possible um, without everyone else's help, too. 
And there are some things that are easier the second or third time around. And that did give us room to build on what we had learned and grow in new ways. Um, we made contact with the Tucson Museum of Art. You know, I think during the second year, they agreed to show the winning pieces from our show at an event that they were hosting at the museum later in the week or later in the year. So that helped make the show more visible and attractive to artists, get the word out. Um, one year we worked with an art class and they created a whole bunch of different art projects that people could participate in live during the event. It made it really a more participatory and interactive event and that was fantastic. We also connected with um, Flandra Planetarium and the University of Arizona Museum of Art uh, to organize special features for the show. Um, we've had musical performances, talks, telescope viewings, artists painting live during the event, sidewalk chalk murals, all kinds of unique things each year. And that's part of, you know, the fun of organizing each year is, okay, what are we going to do different? What's going to be unique this year? And after a few years, we were attracting, you know, typically about 150 artists each year to participate in the show. Some of them were repeats, but many of them were new each year. Um, Artists are participating, come from a variety of, of different backgrounds, skill levels, everything from amateurs to college art students to professionals. Um, you know, we were getting attendance to the show up in the hundreds, up around a thousand some years. We started stretching the show over a whole weekend so that we could accommodate a larger crowd. And really, it was just, it was incredible to see it grow and take root in the community each year and see really that the community really embraced it. And it's not just the artists that are, you know, a great mix of people, it's the, the crowd that attend the show are also a great mix. People from both the science and the art communities, people of different ages, college students, families with kids. So in that respect, we've always been really successful at reaching a lot of different people with these events and often people that, you know, aren't necessarily coming to other types of outreach events because this is, this is different than the other types of work that people have been doing in our department. So fast forward to today and, you know, this year's event is virtual, but it's garnered the most number of submissions we've ever had. And everyone loves an in-person show, but the silver lining here is that we have the potential to reach an even, even wider audience this year, and I'm really, really excited about that. After I graduated from the department, a new group of grad students took over the main show in Tucson, and all in all, you know, this is our 12th art show over eight years, and I really couldn't be prouder of what we've accomplished. I also am not sure I can possibly fit any more art in my house, but so far that has not stopped me, so we'll see this year. Um, but it's it just, it's really amazing to see, for me personally, to see that my efforts and those of my fellow co-organizers in those early years, um, that those efforts were able to live and grow beyond me. And each year I continue to be impressed with the ways that, you know, the new group of organizers grows and evolves the event. And, you know, our efforts are spreading beyond LPL as well. We didn't invent putting science and art together, but we have been publicly successful at doing it. And I get contacted somewhat frequently by folks at other institutions, even folks in other scientific fields who want advice for how they can do something similar. So just, I'm very proud of that. The success of the main show at Tucson also allowed us to branch out into doing smaller satellite events um, at the DPS, the, the Division for Planetary Science Conference uh, each year. This is one of our main planetary science research conferences each year. And these typically I still organize. Um, I don't get to organize the main show anymore in Tucson, so I have to get my art show fixed somewhere. And what I like about doing these is that the conference travels and changes location each year, which allows us to reach whole new communities of people. Um, so each year that I do it, I'll you know reach out and find the local art community where the conference is being held and invite them to submit art. And, and they love this. Not only are we bringing several hundred people from around the world directly to them to see their art, but we're providing a venue for artists to express their love and inspiration of the cosmos to communities that, unlike Tucson, maybe don't necessarily have a strong relationship with science. And it gives conference goers a way to connect with the local community while they visit. And scientists, you know, many scientists also bring art for these shows. 
um, that everyone's able to enjoy uh, between listening to talks and, and other conference things. Over the last few years, some of our other astronomy and planetary science conferences have also started having small art competitions or workshops, things like that, completely independent of our events. And of course, I can't take credit for you know, those things or for people's interest in those things. But I do really think that you know, our efforts with the art of planetary science have really done a lot to show the scientific community not only what a powerful tool art can be to connect with the public, but also a tool for us to connect with and appreciate our own work and our daily lives as researchers. I want to end by commenting briefly on what all this is really for. What have we actually accomplished? OK, we've put on a bunch of art shows. Lots of people have enjoyed them, either by attending or contributing art. So what? Um, as the show grew and evolved, uh, our understanding of the role that this type of event can play in our society also evolved. You know, the power of art as a tool for science communication. Um, and this event, it isn't just about scientists communicating to the public. It's about communicating in both directions. It's about creating a discussion. And for this reason, inclusion is one of our core values. Because using art, anyone can be involved in this discussion. You don't have to be Michelangelo to create or to appreciate art. The act of creating or engaging with science-themed or data-driven artwork helps people to form a meaningful and personal connection to science outside the confines of a classroom. And I think that that's really important. You know, as scientists, we know that it's easy to get people excited about space and space exploration, but it's more difficult to engage them in the science that drives that exploration. Um, and one of our biggest challenges in communicating the details of our research is that many people believe that science is beyond their ability to comprehend. This is ingrained in us at a young age, sometimes, many of us. And as long as people believe that science is beyond their ability to understand, they're going to feel alienated by it. So what these art shows do is provide an opportunity for people to form a meaningful connection to science in a way that doesn't require them to quote unquote understand it in the same way that a scientist might. There's no classrooms, no tests, no expectations. And the experience is, is solely between the individual and the art. So it, it, it's not just a, about people forming a connection to space. It's that connection to science, to exploration through knowledge that we want to cultivate. And of course, we do hope that the audience can learn something from our art pieces, which is why we really like to emphasize the data-driven artwork. But ultimately, it's the connection between the audience and the science that, that matters. And if that connection exists over time, it can help change the way people think about science in a fundamental way. It can influence their voting or lifestyle choices. You know, how much funding maybe we as scientists get um, for our research. And it can really have broad implications for the way that society grows as a result of the creation of scientific knowledge. And this leads to sort of my second point. Asking people to create art for these shows or, or to come view that art allows people outside of academia to participate in defining how and why society values and benefits from scientific knowledge. This is that I get to define what others are inspired by, or how we as a society should put my research to use. We have to flip that camera around and look at science from other people's point of view. You know, everyone needs to be involved in the discussion. So, you know, by inviting people to create science-focused artwork, it gives people a voice in the broader discussion about science and about space exploration. And I like to think that this kind of helps to erode the ivory tower a little bit. And this has never been more important in society than it is today. You know, our society is characterized by a relationship to technology, the golden age of computers, the changing climate, the growing private space industry. It's really important that everyone have a voice right now. now what places are you inspired to explore? How do you feel about sending humans to the moon or Mars? What do you think about mining asteroids?
What role do you think computers play in our lives? What relationship do you have, does society have with our planet, with the night sky, with the stars? You know, these are the kinds of questions we all need to answer and discuss. Um, the kinds of questions that are really going to help shape the future of our society. So we really hope that this art show can offer just a little bit of insight on that. And, you know, we hope through events, you know, this event and, and future events that we can continue to invite people into that conversation. Thanks, everyone, for your attention today. I hope you enjoy the show this year. Um, we hope to continue what we've accomplished in the coming years, whether it's through this art show or maybe a new project down the road, but whatever it is, you know, we hope to, to work with many more of you art and science enthusiasts, and I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do together as, you know, we navigate whatever future holds for humanity and our relationship to space. So, thanks. All right, hope you enjoyed our segment from Dr. Jamie Malaro. She's attempting to get logged on. So we might have to save the Q&A for just a few moments. So if you have Jamie questions, go ahead and hang on to them until we get her logged in. Uh, as you can see, dealing with Zoom has its Zoom etiquette. So we appreciate waiting. So we'll get Jamie in. We have a huge lineup tonight. So we have no shortage of other uh, components to show you. The next mode of operation that we want to highlight is astrophotography. And in addition to the astrophotography, as well as the entities here at the University of Arizona that help facilitate the telescopes and the different photography centers. And I think Jamie actually got on. Good. So we will take a few questions for Jamie, and then we can move into our astrophotography segment after that. So. Let's go ahead and get her on here in just a moment. All right, can you hear me? A moment where you get your audio in here. Okay, we can hear you. Hi. All right. Thank you again for your introduction and our sort of overview of the entire Art of Planetary Science show. As she mentioned, this is our first time ever going virtual. So Jamie is the founder, we like to call her the brainchild of the Art of Planetary <laughs> She was a graduate student here. And I'm honored to be a graduate student that gets to follow in her footsteps. And as she mentioned, you are tired and there's lots of components. And it actually takes an army of graduate students here to all come together. And so we follow in Jamie's footsteps as we kind of pave the way, bringing together data art and fine art. And for the first time in show history, we have a special subcategory of moon art as many of our artists uh, submitted to. It was actually very popular as we are co-partnered with International Observe the Moon Night, which we'll be celebrating tomorrow. And so I'm going to pull up and see if anyone's thrown some questions uh, either in the chat or the best place is to actually throw it into the q and A. I'll be monitoring both, but the q and A is the better way to go. So uh, let's see. He said, hi, Jamie. Yes, founder, you are our leader. Uh, were you able to start a similar TAPS at JPL? And for those of you that don't know all these acronyms, the JPL is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, uh, in which uh, Jamie is very near to uh, remotely, of course. Uh, but were you able to get anything going at JPL? So JPL is an interesting place. It's mostly research and engineering, but it's a very different environment um, than like a university setting at like at U of A. 
um, they actually have a group uh, on lab, we call it instead of on campus. So they have a group um, on lab of artists that actually does do some art installations that they install in various places um, at the facility. Um, and they also work with like different science projects um, that are going on at JPL to produce graphics and other kinds of things like that. Um, so I don't work with them uh, directly um, to do anything actually within JPL, but I have done um, local kind of events, including some people from JPL. And that, um, the, the first one I did was actually a, a TAPS show at a conference that came to town. Um, and so we had a lot of the JPL scientists there. So we did a conference that was in Pasadena in Southern California. And, um, and then after that, I have uh, worked with other JPL groups doing things like um, there's like a chalk festival every year. So we've done space related like chalk murals for things like that. So I've done things here and there, but nothing quite as big or on the same scale as the U of A show here. Great. Yes. And for those that have attended this conference, we get to kind of enjoy the art show um, as, as Jamie mentioned in the video, you know, in between these science talks, which can be long days, you know, staring and listening to other PowerPoint presentations. As you'll notice, we're trying not to have lots of PowerPoint presentations for you all and have a mix of these different performances. And so we're really excited uh, when we go to these conferences and we get to see the art of planetary science. And this year, the Division of Planetary Science is also having a virtual conference. And so Jamie and I are trying to work together to get some closing events for this art show that will also be happening at the same time as the conference uh, in late October. So stay tuned because we'll have a little bit of a special DPS connection uh, later on in the show kind of closing time frame. And I'm kind of curious about your process of when you create art. Do you start out with the idea of the art piece itself or do you look at your data and then formulate? I guess, uh, I don't know if it's top down or bottom up kind of approach, but what's your um, art, your, your data art approach? Uh, good question. So a lot of the pieces that I've made in the past, so like, you know, one of my first big pieces I made was related to my thesis. So that was sort of a specific project that I wanted to use the pages of my thesis for something. So the subject that I picked, you know, was of course this, the subject of my research at the time. Um, but I, after the few that I did after that, I actually picked the subject by person. I make a lot of these pieces specifically as gifts for people, uh, particularly in, you know, my science career, you know, my friends and colleagues that have helped me in my career um, to thank them. And so, you know, I made one for my PhD advisor who studies Mars. So I thought, okay, let's let's pick a spot on Mars. So I did one for the Mars uh, Northern Polar Layer Deposits, those icy cliffs in the, in the poles of Mars. Um, I did one for my postdoc advisor that was, uh, you know, she studies Europa. So I kind of did that. So that's kind of how I got started. And then, you know, from there, as I kind of branched out, you know, a lot of it just has to do with kind of what I happen to be inspired by at the moment. I don't usually start from the data. I usually start from, from the subject itself. Um, I have been for the last couple of years uh, working with the OSIRIS-REx team. It's a NASA mission, an asteroid sample return um, mission put on by NASA. And we're actually getting ready to take our sample from the asteroid next month. So very exciting time. Um, but once I got, you know, involved with them, you know, I, I got excited about what we were doing. So, you know, I made a piece related to the asteroid Bennu, um, and, you know, kind of things like that. Sometimes I think of a piece I want to do and we don't really have the right data actually available, um, which is always a bummer. That just means we need more missions. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of what I happen to be excited about at the time, really. Okay. Yeah, that highlights that we, you know, we have missing data for science components, but maybe we have missing data for art uh, components as well. You know, many of us probably enjoy science fiction and the illustrations that come along with it. And so maybe sci-fi is kind of something that maybe helps us fill in those missing voids, um, at least with what our mind uh, can sort of pop right. up with. You know, sometimes um, it'll also come with, 
you know, I was thinking that I usually do it on what I'm excited about, but actually sometimes it can happen the other way too, if about what data is available. Like I haven't, I've been thinking, I really need to make a piece about Jupiter because the Juno mission is putting out all of these amazing images of Jupiter that we've never been able to see before. Um, and I hadn't thought about Jupiter before because I don't work on anything related to it. Uh, I work on some of its moons, but I don't do any gas giant work. Um, so I hadn't thought about that one until the data itself was available. So I guess it kind of goes both directions there. Yes, yes, I could see that. Um, so I know that there's been some works for a publication for the Art of Planetary Science. And do you want to talk a few moments about that? I know it's uh, um, in, a, in a more of a production state. Um, I think it's a really special tool that a lot of our folk might want to hear a little bit about. Um, sure, yeah, we are trying to publish a book. We haven't um, solicited any specific works for the book yet, uh, but we have taken um, images that we've gotten of people's art that have been in past shows to um, kind of make some example page layouts and things like that that we could show um, to, you know, with our book proposal to a publisher and be like, look, you know, this art is is really incredible, uh, you know, it will allow us to bring this work to a bigger audience, bring this discussion to a bigger audience of, you know, what is it that, you know, that we're excited about, that we're studying right now, you know, the science art connection, all those kinds of things. And so um, we would really like to, to, you know, do a whole sort of art book on this and, and ask all of you, you know, folks watching, people in this show and in past years to, to kind of pick their favorite pieces and, and submit. Um, we'll probably kind of, you know, we don't always do this for the shows. You have, you know, a, a new category this year where you're kind of spotlighting moon art. Um, so what we're gonna probably do with the book is um, choose a series of categories uh, to separate the art into kind of visually in the book, but not so much on topic. Um, we're thinking about categories like, like processes or, or scales and perspectives uh, and things like that to kind of, you know, exploration. Um, topics to kind of separate the works in sort of a more, I don't really know how to say it, um, we don't want we don't want a whole chapter of only Pluto, right? You know, but but we do want to guide readers in in the way that they're viewing the art to really show what the pieces, the meat of the pieces. You know, if if you see a like a, a painting of a landscape, the landscape itself is pretty, but that painting is also showing a lot of like geologic processes that that carve and form that landscape over time. So we want to be able to highlight those types of things. Um, in the book and and of course of course the pieces that ultimately go into it are whatever you know everyone submits whatever people whatever people are excited about and, and inspired to make art about so um, so we're hoping for that we're in the process of talking to publishers but we have not yet um, found one if anyone watching is a publisher contact me Yes, yeah, any publishers out there, open call. Um, yeah, this is really wonderful. So my mind jumps to uh, here at the University of Arizona, we have the high rise camera, which is a high resolution science experiment on, on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And there mm -hmm. are sort of table coffee books that uh, they put together with all of these amazing imagery uh, from the surface of Mars, um, where we have centimeters per pixel, where you can resolve the things the size of a desk um, in this lookbook. And so my mind jumps to this type of lookbook that you should have, you know, in, 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 in addition to these, uh, you know, data imagery books, you know, this should be something as well. And the other thought I had is that we've been in the shows long enough that the themes are emerging, although there are probably some folk who would want a book of all Pluto. Uh, <laughs> we can uh, have both, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, breakouts, breakout books. Um, right. Yeah. And let's see, I'm just kind of monitoring the chat on the side and just in general, I'm, I'm picking up a theme that everyone's really excited to see you, Jamie. There's lots of chat. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, they've missed you. So um, really good to see. Um, I'll make a call right now for any following questions for uh, any, any follow up questions for Jamie here before uh, we let her go and, and move on to the next component of the show. But if anyone has any other thoughts? I'm checking the monitor. I'm looking here, but I don't see anything pop up. Again, 
Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you for starting the show. I think I'm not the only one to say that. Thank you for continuing at our uh, division, Planetary Science Conferences, and keeping it engaged with the public. And we hope to keep working with you. And we uh, hope maybe the university press would take on to this table book. We'll uh, see. And we'll thank you, Allison. It's a great show this year. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll take care. All right. Well, as I sort of uh, alluded to a little bit earlier in the show, we are going to now take some time to look at some astrophotography, which you will probably notice happens a lot, a lot around Tucson here. We like to say we have the most telescopes in the world. If you didn't know, Tucson Basin is surrounded by telescopes in every which way, direction you would like to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a video from the Center for Creative Photography, who has worked with Mount Lemmon Sky Center and our following presenter, who will be up after that, Adam Block. You might know Adam Block from Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine or uh, the astronomy picture of the day, which he'll be showing us uh, today's photo as well. But before we get into Adam Block, I just want to give a little bit of this video precursor for the Center for Creative Photography as they work to uh, hopefully put on more astrophotography workshops in the future as well. And also we'll do a little bit of an intro to the Mount Lemmon Sky Center in which Adam Block is a major and founder uh, component of. And then again, we'll play the video for Adam Block. And just like we had the live Q&A, we'll also have a live Q&A for Adam Block following the video. So we'll go right now into the Center for Creative Photography. And we do not have them live to answer questions. Although if you do have questions for them, please feel free to put them in the chat and we can forward any questions. Like I mentioned, we hope to actually put on more astrophotography workshops and other events with them in the near future. So hopefully uh, maybe this gets you guys a little bit familiar with some of the other University of Arizona um, art, art outlets that we actually have here. So we'll go ahead and go into the Center for Creative Photography and then we'll go right into the introduction for the Mount Lemmon Sky Center. I'll come back and I'll introduce Adam Block. And I hope you guys enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Meg Jackson Fox, the Associate Curator of Academic and Public Programs at the Center for Creative Photography. And I'm Brian Genter, Assistant Program Manager at the Center for Creative Photography. And we're so excited to be joining you for this event. Um, astrophotography and the Center are very much connected and we have a rich holding that we're excited to share with you tonight. We start with this first image that was actually gifted by the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona. Um, it's this beautiful 360 degree view of the Martian landscape. Um, the uh, Mars Pathfinder mission landed on the red planet uh, on um, Independence Day, July 4th in uh, 1997. I remember it as, as a young boy in school being really excited about it. Um, but we have this beautiful 360 degree view um, from the um, Carl Sagan Memorial Station. And there's a wide variety of images that were made, uh, over 15,000 images were made um, during this mission. And some are just classically beautiful landscapes where we have this lovely rule of thirds and the horizon is off in the distance. And we have this beautiful kind of inclusion of the foreground. These are not only scientific, but aesthetic objects. And so they, they are very much special. There you can see the, the rover uh, sojourner um, in, in the midground. In addition to these landscapes, we have beautiful abstractions, including um, this cloudscape of the, the Martian sky. So there's this wide range, and we're gonna get into a little bit more of the, the scientific, uh, image and then the aesthetic image. So I'm going to turn things over to Meg and she's going to describe a little bit about the center and what we do. Yes, yeah, so the Center for Creative Photography is a museum and an archive and it's dedicated to the history of photography. 
we have about 100,000 fine prints and 8 million archival objects and counting and uh, oral history collection that's been ongoing since approximately 1975 when we were founded. And on our second floor is where you'll find our non-circulating library, as well as a print viewing room that you see here in the photograph, where we hold class sessions in normal times, quote unquote, um, bringing prints and archival objects out according to the needs of an educator or a researcher or a student, and where we hold public print viewings, which are something like a pop-up exhibition for an evening around a particular topic. And on our first floor, you'll also find galleries with art exhibitions that are free and open to students and faculty and the public as well. And so our archives offer an opportunity for researchers and students and educators to study particular artists or institutions or scholars in the history of photography. But there is also plenty of opportunity for primary research that is interdisciplinary or thematic such as um, political protests or the Spanish Civil War, which I was looking at recently, or the American landscapes or skyscapes or planetscapes, um, and yeah, lunar, lunar and planetary sciences. And so it's really quite unique for an art institution to be dedicated to a single medium. And with our conservation lab, we really are this 360 experience of photography from its preservation and exhibition to its education and conservation. And so this is the Tetons and Snake River by Ansel Adams. And we were co-founded in 1975 by Ansel Adams, a famous American landscape, probably one of the most well-known landscape photographers and environmentalists. And by then UA president, Dr. John Schaefer, who was originally a chemistry professor, in fact, um, with a, a love of photography and as a photographer himself. And it was um, Ansel's, Ansel Adams' support of the center and the presence of his archive here that proved a critical catalyst for so many 20th century photographers to likewise have their archives eventually settle here in Tucson. So in addition to North American photographers and especially photographers of the American West, CCP is known for its collection of Mexican modernism like we see here with Lola Alvarez Bravo, or its rich holdings in Japanese photography from the 20th century. We have a number of work from photojournalists and Amer American documentary photographers. And here soon, a movie will be coming out about um, one of this photojournalists, who's W. Gene Smith, or Gene Smith, um, one of his documentary projects in Japan, and the movie is Minamata, starring Johnny Depp, and it was really closely researched here at the CCP, so we're super excited to see it uh, after post-production. We also have a significant body of work by American fashion photographers, as well as local photographers to the Southwest and to Tucson, like uh, Luis Carlos Bernal. So perhaps the most famous moon picture that we have in our collection is this Moonrise by Ansel Adams. And there's a lovely story that goes along with this image that at the end of uh, a long day of shooting, Ansel's driving back with a few other people that he went out making photographs with, and he happens upon this small town, Hernandez, New Mexico, and he sees the light. It's just perfect as it's glistening off the crosses and the foreground, the clouds, everything's perfect. He, he knows he has only so much time. And back in the day when we were using film, he had only one exposure, one image that he could make. And in his scrambling, he could locate his light meter to tell him what the proper exposure for the image would be. And so he actually uses his knowledge of how many foot candles the moon puts out in order to obtain um, his most well-known image, Moonrise. Um, in addition to uh, his love of landscape, Ansel was very interested in music as well as sciences in general. His, um, his father was uh, the treasurer of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and so, Adams, uh, throughout his entire life, has had this connection to astronomy. He and his father would take 
trips to um, Mount Williams, Williamson, I'm sorry, where the Lick Absor uh, Observatory is located. So you can see uh, here an image uh, from inside the 20 inch telescope at, at the Lick Observatory and uh, a solar eclipse here on the right, which interestingly enough, um, the Cantonville, California doesn't exist. It's actually Camptonville that's really close to the Lick Observatory. And Adams is notorious for misdating, mistitling his work. And so this eclipse most likely took place in 1930. So there's a lot of digging and kind of research that still needs to be done on all of these works. And what's really nice is that like places like the center where there's a rich archive, there's opportunities for scholars, artists, to um, reimagine, to rethink those materials that first here started out as scientific documents. And what Linda Condren has done is taken glass plates from uh, the Lick Observatory's collection and print, print them out uh, using a printing out process. And there are these beautiful, uh, objects that talk about the connection between knowledge and inspiration. They're incredibly aesthetic and beautiful objects. And perhaps you may recognize some of these uh, photographs. They were in a, a show that the center had in 2015, curated by uh, Joshua Chuang called um, Astronomical. And it was incredibly popular. So I hope you were able to stop by and see it, but it featured all kinds of artworks that were loaned from the LPL and all kinds of scientific agencies and uh, private collectors. And so they were grouped according by subject. Here are images of solar eclipses as seen from the earth. And then if you remember and were there, uh, an enormous projection um, of the uh, NASA's solar dynamic uh, uh, observatory uh, of the moon and these solar flares. It was just quite, quite an amazing exhibition. And so this gets us to think about what makes a fine art object? Is it purely something that is beautiful and you know conveys a certain emotion? Could data, could photographs of say Jupiter's moon Ganymede, could that become an aesthetic fine art object? And in fact, at the center, we have a number of uh, photographs of um, planetary surfaces, things that you may not consider to be a fine art object, but look at this thing. It is beautiful, hand, you know, handmade um, collages of uh, Ganymede's surface. You know, this is from Voyager 2, and between the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 missions, incredibly, 80% of uh, Ganymede's surface had been photographed. And so we see this time and time again with artists, this case, uh, American uh, photographer and painter, Len Gittleman, re rehashing, retaking these scientific documents, creating abstracts like Gettleman does here to reframe, to rethink these profound um, objects and to place them in an aesthetic and fine art context. And so what we wanted to do was share a selection of photographs from our collection that might be of interest to all of you out there who are tuning in to the Art of Planetary Science this year and the many ways in which photographers image our skies, nature's phenomena, uh, atmospheric and astronomical events and the like. And our photographs on such topics range from the quite literal of a radio telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, by Andreas Feiniger, like is on the screen, to this very long exposure next to it by photographer David Munch, made it the city of Rock State Park in New Mexico. And it also goes to photographs that can lean more towards the poetic, as here in Barbara Bosworth's stunning black and white photo entitled Christmas Solar Eclipse in My Father's Hands. And this was part of a project about her family life in and around her childhood home in Ohio, where she traces through her photographs the sense of wonder at the landscape her father first instilled in her. And the CCP's collection includes contemporary works like Bosworth's here, 
to these earlier works that swing between the emotive and the documentary, including Adolf Fassbender's Solar Eclipse captured in New York City. We think maybe this is Central Park. It looks a little bit like Central Park um, in January 1925. And from the eclipse itself to folks' experience of the eclipse, like this amazing photograph documenting citizens in Paris viewing the 1912 solar eclipse. And maybe this was you in August 2017. And we find the motivation to photograph so interesting and in that it ranges between actually seeing the natural event itself to, to capturing the human's experience of that event. So you kind of get this, between the photographs, you kind of get this total experience of it, if you will. And what we can read in so many photographers' work from the late 19th century, which is about the time of our collection uh, to now, is a fascination with astronomical bodies, with our solar system and space, and you know, just this preoccupation with their cultural influence and impact. And as you might read here in the inclusion of an actual postage stamp, so this speaking to a kind of pop cultural, everyday mass cultural excitement around this. And lastly, but certainly not least, our collection of photojournalism includes no small amount of historical visual records of astronauts. And we included this because it was so interesting and we have no idea anything about this image. Um, the photographer is unknown. We have no context for it. So it's completely out of context. So if you know anything about this, email us, call us, let us know. But we also have these images of the celebrity and the celebration around the astronauts in the U.S. space program in the 1960s. In a more recent, uh, if we're calling the, the 1990s recent, I still call the 1990s recent, uh, missions like STS-95 on Space Shuttle Discovery when John Glenn became the oldest man to fly in space. And the photographer here, the photojournalist David Hume Kennerly, who captured these images, He's a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer who was President Ford's White House photographer and his archive was a major acquisition of the U University of Arizona and the Center for Creative Photography that we announced just last October. You might have seen some of the, um, the, the uh, yeah, all of the pieces of the ball that Brian just shown here that you can see uh, Mr. Kennerly with those that we put out in the mall last October. So in addition to having our resources online where you can search our, um, our collection uh, electronically uh, to um, events like this one that we have, perhaps you were able to tune in last year when David Kennerly was in conversation with uh, John Meacham about his life's work. And so we're celebrating again this uh, acquisition of such an immense um, archive an important uh, selection of images from world American history uh, that uh, David King Kennerly will be back in conversation one year later in an event uh, presented by Bank of America. You can uh, check that out on October 15th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Arizona time. Um, it'll be streaming through the center's uh, YouTube and Facebook pages. So for more information, please, please visit our website. Um, in addition uh, to the Kennerly talk, we have um, an amazing uh, photojournalist who is working in the moment, Sheriff May, who um, will be in conversation on September 28th uh, from 4 to 5.30, again, Arizona time, talking about her life's work as a documentary photographer, what it means to be making photographs in this moment, documenting protests. Um, it is going to be an amazing conversation. Again, you can check that out on the Center's YouTube and Facebook pages. Um, and uh, thank you so much. This is a privilege to be a part of your event. We hope that you'll reach out to us, do some research online about our holdings of astrophotography, lunar photography. Um, we hope to hear from you and that you'll join us soon for one of our events. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, hope you enjoy.